Welcome back to 2K Away. Well, welcome back to 2K Away. I'm Peyton and this is my sister Paige. And normally we're 2,000 miles away from one another, but we're in the same location right now. And Mm -hmm. we talk about true crime and all the weird and creepy things Mm -hmm. so um last week Paige finished up part two of charles cullen i'm glad that we're done with him because he um pissed me off he angers me yeah i i just keep thinking like weasley fuck that's how i describe (laughs) him now in my brain well and you see those pictures that i posted how he he literally has that serial killer look down yeah yeah, Bleh. Bleh. he's like a rodent that I wouldn't want as a pet. <laughs> because all other rodents, obviously, are, are game good for pets. For me, yes, yes. So I don't have any business, so we're just gonna hop right into the case. This is gonna be a little bit of a long one, so buckle in. <laughs> so today I'm bringing you the case of Mitchell Carlton Sims and Ruby Carolyn Paget. So these two were known as the pizza killers at the time. Pizza killers. The pizza killers. And their crime spree was a period of three weeks in 1985. <laughs> and just like, you know, people make fun of the term serial killer. Like you have a box of cereal and you're like stomping it. So that makes me think that they're throwing pizza in the street and just fucking annihilating the pizza. No. <laughs> so, you know, there's really not a whole lot on these guys. Like, they don't even have a Wikipedia page, for Whoa. example. Yeah. Everything so, has a Wikipedia page. Yes. Uh, they don't. Interesting. So, right. I'm going to do it a little differently. I'm going to start with Mitchell, and then I'll go into Ruby's background once she comes into Mitchell's story, because he's basically, like, the main protagonist here. So, as far as background goes, now, I don't have, like, nitty-gritty details that we can get on some of these serial killers, unfortunately. But <laughs> what I do know is that Mitchell Carlton Sims was born on February 12, 1960, and was raised in Columbia, South Carolina. He was the youngest of three children. I don't know his parents' names or his siblings' names. Oh. Um, just not really much on the internet about them that I could even find. Hmm. Because I was able to find, um, spoiler alert, Mitchell goes to prison, but um, I was able to find like some of he and Ruby's appeals, but just not really a a ton out there on their background. Because I looked for that specifically, just trying to get the nitty gritty details, but I couldn't really find much. Hmm. And maybe I just wasn't looking in the right places, but I, I couldn't find anything. So Mitchell grew up in very humble, abusive beginnings. Hmm. So, William, I think it's Vicari, um, a forensic psychiatrist that would later interview Mitchell and Ruby during their trials, said that Mitchell Sims' family background was one of the most horrific that he had encountered in his entire career as a forensic psychiatrist. Oh, no. And, um, you know, since we started this podcast, since we love true crime, we read about horrible childhoods this is probably one of the worst that i've read about oh shit even with the small details that i do have so i mean it really was a breeding ground for a fucked up mind and serial killer yes so i do know that a stepfather came into the picture very very early in mitchell's life Mm -hmm. Um, this man was verbally and physically abusive he would literally beat mitchell with his fists Um, And around seven years old, oh my gosh, Mitchell said that his stepfather began sexually abusing him. Oh gosh. So this happened over a prolonged period of time, like so long that Mitchell was so traumatized for it that at times he would become like so reclusive that he would just sit and stare into space. Mm. And I, when I read that, I kind of thought like, I think that as a child, like when you're experiencing that, I think that is kind of like your mind is leaving your body just to be a little free uh, for a I time. I mean, yeah. And, and you know, and sometimes that's how people can describe like the reason why somebody gets 
not it's not multiple personalities it's this oh. uh did it, did did yeah yeah i'm like Duh. did yeah that's because they you know the original person has to take a break from all of the shit that exactly. they're experiencing yeah it's it's a way for your mind to comp- to compartmentalize right. the abuse that it has experienced yeah um but it gets it gets worse oh um that's not at good. one point the abuse got so bad the stepfather would force Mitchell to have sex with his siblings. Oh, my gosh. And his mother. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Oh, so people like that are, wow. Yeah, they, so that's, mm. that's just a little bit of information that I have on his childhood. Holy shit, And man. just from that little bit, I'm like, wow, that is, that is one of the worst that I've heard. Why, why are there people like that? That people are so, can be so disgusting. Yeah, I know. I know. But at 18, he enlisted in the army. Um, by all accounts, he was a good shul- good soldier. Um, he did what he was told, and if he wanted to, he, he probably could have made a career out of it. Um, I think he went into the military to get that stability that well, a horrific and chaotic childhood just didn't provide right, him. Right, that makes sense. Um, unfortunately, though, he was dishonorably discharged after only being in for two years. Oh, he tried to, f- this story is nuts. He tried to frame a fellow soldier for shooting him. So apparently Mitchell got involved with an officer's wife and made a plan to have an army buddy shoot him and somehow place blame on this officer that he's cuckolding oh, so that he and the shit. wife could be together. Oh, I don't shit. know exactly how he would have placed blame on this man. <laughs> Whatever. So the buddy does shoot him. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but the army, of course, sees right through it. <laughs> what a pal. Right. I'm like, look, now that's a friend. If you ask your friend to shoot you and they shoot you, <laughs> no, no, don't shoot your friends. <laughs> don't. Even if they ask you, <laughs> don't do that. No. No. So, dude, this is a great plan. Right. So you're going to shoot me, right? And then we're going to place the gun in the officer's hand. Yeah. It's like, like I don't know. I have no idea how he thought that could have worked I ever. I don't understand in, the in thought In process. any universe. Yeah. I don't either. So the army saw right through it. They're like, no. <laughs> <laughs> so they ended up charging him and he ended up doing a stint in Fort Leavenworth. Oh, wow. Um, but it wasn't very long because he was out of prison by 1980. Um, he was 20 years old. So oh, he only yeah. spent two years technically in the military. So he was probably only he, in for a few months. Probably. Because, I mean, like, it's in the grand scheme of things, that's kind of like a minor thing. Yeah. Really. So he didn't do very long in there. Um, he returned to Columbia and ended up marrying a childhood friend named Teresa, who was only 16 at the time. Gross. Oh, good. Um. And people said that she seemed like the more mature of the two, oh, which doesn't surprise good. me. And they ended up having three children together. Okay. So fast forward to January 1985. This is now um, five years after he's been out of the military. He's 25 years old. Mitch started working as a manager at a Domino's Pizza in Columbia. He was doing well here. He actually liked the work. But there was a dispute about low pay with a boss and and there was an argument and there was like some sort of like falling out between he and that boss. So after all that, um, he was expected to get some bonus and I, I've seen two things that it was cut either like entirely from his pay or it was like a portion of the bonus was cut Hmm. either way. He was so pissed that he didn't get this bonus that he tried to to get everyone that worked there to quit in protest. Oh. Um, he even went as far as trying to organize a strike against the company. Like, started working for a picketing company and everything, but his co-workers didn't join him. <laughs> and this made Mitch even more pissed and bitter. Yeah. Um, He's in, trying to start this thing and he, nobody's following him. Yeah, which I fucking wouldn't. I mean, yeah. I'd be like, you want me to quit my job so you can get a raise? Maybe I'm heartless. I don't know. But I don't know. I, I guess if the, if I knew the circumstances of not getting the bonus, maybe. 
Well, yeah, because I mean, if it was something that it, they like, were, if it was truly really, preposterous of where, like, the reason well, why he like, didn't get yeah, the bonus like, or hey, something. Hey, you're a really hard worker, and I, I have no idea why they wouldn't give you that bonus. They just took that from you. That's bullshit. Let's all go complain. Yeah, but I don't know. I don't know the circumstances. But um, in May of '85, um, being fed up with the way he was being treated, he sent a complaint to the corporate offices of Domino's, but he never got a response. And ultimately just quit his job. Oh. So after this, he worked a series of odd jobs, but could never make enough money to pay his bills and also support a wife and three children. Yeah. Um, This whole situation made the marriage start to fall apart. Yeah. As it would. Yeah. And when Mitch's marriage started to fall apart, he started having an affair with another woman who he had met during the strike that he tried to orchestrate. Because that's what you need right, to do. Right, that's the solution. You, right, right, right. This woman's name was Ruby Paget. Oh. So Ruby Carolyn Paget was born, I believe, in 1965. I'm not really sure when her birthday actually is. Hmm. I couldn't find it. I even looked her up on um, the prison where she is. I even looked at the prison website and I couldn't find it. All I found was her inmate number. How in the world could you not find that? Because that's normally, at least for Illinois DOC, and I have to get on that frequently, um, the birthday is like right under their name and picture. Well, again, maybe I just didn't look at the right place, but I couldn't find her actual birth date. Weird. I don't know. She was 19 at at the time when they met and was 20 by the time that they did their crimes. So sometime in the summer, I'm assuming. I don't know. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) So she came from very impoverished beginnings. Her family went from trailer park to trailer park. Uh, her father was an abu- abusive alcoholic and would regularly beat Ruby's mother pretty ruthlessly in front of Ruby. Of course. Um, around 15 or 16, she decided to run away from home. And she would sleep from couch to couch to bed to bed. Yeah. Just basically going anywhere or going to whoever would take her in. Just try. I mean... I mean, anybody would, trying to get away from all that. Exactly. So she was very pretty. And I'll I'll show you pictures. Like, she was a very pretty girl. Um, So that helped her get men to take her in and support her for a short time. Right. Uh, These men were often physically and verbally abusive to her as well. Jeez. And when the, I don't really want to call it relationship, but when the relationship had run its course, however the ending, um, she would move on to the next one. Right. So she worked odd jobs doing what she could for money, Mm -hmm. Um, but what money she did make, she would usually spend it on alcohol and drugs. Oh, gosh. So the summer of 85, when her and Mitch met, there apparently was kind of an instant connection between them because they ended up sharing their shitty childhoods with one another. And the forensic psychiatrist that I had mentioned before, again, he also interviewed Ruby during their trials, and he said that they were like two lost souls that came together. And then ended up doing horrible things. Yep. Why do these people find each other? I don't know. It's, it's, it's nuts. I've always wondered that, where I'm like, how in the world do two people like this end up with one another? Well, and but- you wonder, like, if they hadn't actually found each other to do the horrible things... Would they have just found somebody else to do the horrible things with? Would they have done it on their own? I'll get to that at the All end right. of what I think. So sit down. <laughs> this is what you do to me. <laughs> <laughs> you ask too many questions Shh. to start off with. Shh. So Mitchell left his wife and abandoned his children for Ruby. Of course he did. Yeah. And the pair moved into a trailer in North Charleston, South Carolina to start a new life. I'm not sure really where Columbia is in South Carolina, but obviously I know where Charleston is. Um, I love how I say, obviously I know where Charleston is. Why why would it be obvious, Peyton? Come on. Okay. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know either. Okay. So when things first started out in the relationship, when Mitch still worked at Domino's, because he began the affair when he still worked at Domino's. um, Was she working there too, I'm assuming? No. Oh. They somehow met at like a picket thing. I have I have no idea what the hell she was doing there. All right. I, I don't know, man. Um, he would complain to her about how he would want to, like, violently hurt or kill his Domino's boss and even bought a gun during this time. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was also a twenty five caliber gun. 
I wrote this on my hand because I forgot to write it in my notes. That's what I have written, 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 (laughs) written on my hand. Goodness. Okay. I know. So their new life basically consisted of becoming heavy substance abusers. Um, Uh. Mitchell did drink, but started drinking even more with Ruby and they would basically do whatever drugs they could get their hands on. Also, Ruby wasn't working. So Mitch had to support them both. Now, I saw in one source that apparently... The one source that I saw this in was um, the documentary. I wouldn't even really call it a documentary. The um, Killer Couples. Mm -hmm. (sighs) Which is... It's okay. The narration, it's... The recreations are really bad. Yeah. The narration's really overly dramatic mm-hmm. to the point where it reminds me of those voiceovers where it's like, in a world. Like, that's what it reminds me of. That's kind of how the killer nurses was. Yeah. So, in that, again, I don't even want to call it a documentary because it wasn't. But in that, because I did watch it and I was like, this was not even worth watching. But I'm sorry to whoever produces that, but I don't um, like it. Because they'd be listening to our podcast, right. definitely. Well, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so I saw in that that it supposedly, according to that, Ruby had that typical California dream of like moving to Hollywood and being a big old movie star, you know. And supposedly Mitch promised that he would help her achieve that. And she wasn't happy with the fact that they were nowhere close to her dreams. That they were still on the wrong side of the country right. for that. <laughs> and she supposedly gave him an ultimatum like get money so we can leave or I'll leave. But okay. I'm not sure of how that whole situation, how true that even is. I didn't find that anywhere else because I feel like Ruby might not have been in the position to necessarily leave this living situation. Or Mitch well, did provide for her. Yeah. But either way, she wasn't happy with Mitch's efforts to support her. She was like, we don't have enough money. So and clearly I can't get a job. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what made her think that he could be the only supportive one. I don't know. I don't know, man. This is just a situation. <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me. I don't know why. <laughs> I love how I say don't ask me, but I'm the one bringing the story to the right. podcast. Okay, anyway. So, either way, she wasn't happy with Mitch's efforts to support her. Um, what little money he did manage to make, they always ended up spending it on drugs and alcohol. But see, there's there you go. I mean, if you didn't do that. Well, I know that. It probably helped. Well, I know that, but who knows? Maybe they didn't. So, in November of 85, Mitch swallowed his pride and applied for a job at another Domino's Pizza in Hanahan, mm. South Carolina. I mean, I, I totally get why he wouldn't want to do that, though. I mean, if he, if he I felt like he was screwed out of bonus money or that he was supposed to get or something, totally get why he wouldn't want to work there again. Yeah, I mean, I do, too. But at the same time, it's like, what the fuck else are you going to do? Like, if you need money that bad, like, don't be a dick. Right. Just go. Right. Like, you have the experience. You can get hired. Right. And Hanahan, South Carolina is, like, just north of, like, North Charleston. Mm-hmm. He applied for a job at this Domino's Pizza in Hanahan, but they only hired him on part-time delivering pizzas. He felt like this was a huge slap in the face, Yeah, but it's not like he had the luxury of turning it down. Right. Um, so only after only working there a couple of weeks, his truck broke down oh, and shit. he couldn't afford to fix it. So he couldn't deliver pizzas and was now worse off than before. Right. So Mitchell devised a plan to rob the dominoes where he worked. He knew the systems. He knew the operations. He knew where the money was kept. But are you stealing a car to get there, too? Or, I mean, your truck broke down and you can't drive your truck. I don't know how You're he, gonna I don't know how he got run there. Run away on foot? I don't know, man. I almost but, said street. No. <laughs> You're going to run away on the street? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, basically, this was all because of the bruised ego that he didn't get a bonus right like that's that's all this was so he devises a plan now i don't know how involved ruby was in the planning and i'll talk about it later too 
or if she was even involved in the planning. Mm -hmm. So December 4th, 85, is when Mitchell decides to rob the Dominoes. I don't have all the details of the robbery. robbery. Um, I have more of the aftermath details because, unfortunately, both witnesses to this robbery were killed. Oh, shit. The two men working there that evening were 24-year-old Gary Melky and 24-year-old Christopher Zare. Mm. Um, Chris was originally from Oakley, Kansas, and Gary was from Moorhead, North Carolina, which we've been to. We've been there! Yeah. <laughs> um, both came from loving and supportive families. Uh, they were both in the Navy at this point and had known each other for years and were good friends. I think they knew each other since, like, basic. Uh, they were stationed at Charleston, where at the time there was a very, like, prevalent, like, naval presence there. Mm -hmm. And both of them worked at the Naval Hospital. Now, the hospital treated Navy servicemen and their dependents, and they weren't making a ton of money. So both of them decided to get part-time jobs to supplement their income. And I think that's awful that yeah. men in the military needed to get second jobs just yeah, to support themselves. Absolutely. Naturally, they worked long hours. You know, they would go to the hospital. They would work at Domino's at night, you know, on weekends, that sort of thing. Chris helped deliver and make the pizzas, and Gary worked his way up to assistant store manager. Now, this wasn't anything that, like, he wanted to make into a career or anything. This was just, like... Literally just to help supplement. Yeah, but it was, it was like, a nice little, like... They, they were making good money from it, yeah. you know? By all accounts, they were both just really upstanding guys. So, Mitchell entered the store around midnight just before closing. He waited until he knew there were only two in the building... He used his gun to get them on the ground and then cut the cords to the phone and bound both men with phone cords. He then trashed the place and took the money. So he had the money. He had what he came for, but he decided not to leave any witnesses and execution style shot Chris and Gary. Oh my gosh. Then left. So sadly, Chris was killed instantly. Mitchell shot Gary. I'm not sure how many times Chris was shot, but Mitchell shot Gary four times in the temple, the jaw, the base of his skull, and his neck. Oh my gosh. But he was still alive. Oh, somehow, gosh. somehow, Gary managed to get to his truck. He drove it a little ways to the police station, which wasn't very far away Holy from the Domino's. Holy shit. Um, and ended up stumbling into the police station somewhere between 2 and 2.30 a.m. Oh my gosh, talk about a fucking hero. With four gunshot wounds to his head. Holy yeah. shit. So he walks in, he's covered in blood, some of his teeth are even missing. Oh well, yeah, from the shots shot in because, the jaw. Because they said that it looked like he was shot directly in the mouth, is what they lo they said oh, it looked like. Oh gosh. Um, so... They realize that he's in a Domino's uniform. He's, like, trying to talk. There's blood coming out of his mouth. Oh, yeah. He um, even still has the phone cords wrapped around his wrists. Holy crap. All that he manages to say when he's in the police station is that there's a robbery where he worked. So the police chief, I, I believe he's retired now. The Hanahan police chief at the time, Melvin Bellew, um, I, I saw an interview of him of another, like, docu- series kind of mm -hmm. documentary that i saw and he literally said it was god's will for him to make it there and i'm like is that's not the fucking truth i don't know what is oh my god so officers are dispatched to the dominoes of course like gary was taken to the emergency room uh the door was open and the lights were on so certain areas were in disarray and there was blood everywhere and they noticed the phone cords had been removed and that the register and safe were both open and the cash was gone uh, they then got to the back of the store to find Chris Zare, also in uniform, also shot in the head. They see that he is also bound with a phone cord like Gary was, and sadly, they see that Chris didn't make it. So the Charleston County Crime Unit came to the scene because they they were better equipped to handle this kind of situation. Yeah. So all the investigators searched for clues. Um, of course, at the time, there's no DNA, so they could only take, you know, blood samples and fingerprints. But right. of course fingerprints was an absolute nightmare because you're in a restaurant you got to think of every potential customer Ooh, and every employee that would be awful yeah absolute nightmare um they did manage to recover a bullet that exited the head of one of the victims 
it, that had lodged into a wall and it was a 25 caliber weapon mm-hmm. which again is what i wrote on my arm on my <laughs> hand not realizing that i had actually written it up here okay <laughs> so it, yeah i know so at this point gary is at the hospital in very critical condition obviously yeah. so they managed to stabilize him enough to get him to describe the shooter to an officer that went with him holy shit yeah. man so yeah an officer went with him to the hospital they got him stable enough so he could describe the shooter and one of um i believe it was the police chief that said like they had to like keep wiping the blood from his mouth so he could I talk i cannot imagine yeah I, I that's just so vivid like in my mind yeah where i'm like that that's crazy um, so Gary tells the officer that he knows exactly who shot him. Oh. Um, it was a recently hired Domino's employee named Mitchell Sims. Holy crap. And despite the condition that Gary was in and the excruciating pain he must have been in, yeah. he was able to give a really good description of Mitchell. Wow. Yeah. So thank God for Gary. So that, that is a true definition of a hero. Oh Yeah. So police contacted the store manager and he came to the scene and pulled Mitchell's application and gave it to the police. Um, Police called some of Mitchell's family. Mm -hmm. I don't know who in Mitchell's family. And they told him that he's living in a trailer with a woman named Ruby Padgett. And they even called some of her family members. Hmm. So the the trailer park was in another jurisdiction. It was in the North Charleston jurisdiction. So Hanahan PD had to get get help from North Charleston PD. So they went to the trailer park that night, but apparently they couldn't figure out which trailer it was. I don't know exactly how that worked. Start knocking on all the doors then. But they didn't have a search warrant yet. But, well, but th- it doesn't mean that you can't just knock on a door and just ask who's home. I don't know exactly how this went down, but they ended up going back, getting a search search warrant. Sore. Yeah, I know. Search warrant. Getting a search warrant. And then they came, they went back like later that morning. Because oh, remember, okay. like Gary stumbled into the police station between like 2 and 2.30 a.m. Right, a. right. So they got there later that morning. And of course, when they got there, it's too late because in that time gap, Mitchell and Ruby managed to flee. <sighs> so police checked airlines, bus stations, and motels in the area. And to help their efforts, investigators gave Mitchell's name and picture to all the local TV stations in case he was still in the area. Oh, that would be terrifying. Yeah. And it was just Mitchell's picture because at this point, the police didn't know what part Ruby played in this robbery slash murder, if any. Right. So with these efforts, they got information that Mitchell may have taken a bus out of Charleston. So the Hanahan PD contacted the FBI and agents were sent to work with them. Good. So... Um, you know, besides the snafu with the trailer park, I think Hanahan PD did a pretty good job of, even though it's a small department, because I think Hanahan is like a town of like 20,000 people. So regardless, I think they did a pretty good job of like with every step that they took. Well, and it seems like they got everything done pretty quickly. So that helps. Yeah. So it definitely did. So once the manhunt started expanding, police received news that Gary Milkey had passed away. Oh, gosh. This was less than a week after the shooting. So not only was this heartbreaking, but the only bit of evidence they had was Gary's testimony. Right. And now it's gone. So no witnesses, no testimony, and they have no leads. So the case was starting to turn cold. Do you want to know how much Mitchell got from the robbery? How Probably much not money? very much. $1,100. Oh, that's more than I expected, actually. But still, he killed two people. For $1,000. For $1,000. Yep. Which I know other people have killed more people for a lot less. Well, yeah, but still, that... I know. (sighs) It's just, it's awful. So, fast forward a little bit to December 8th. Mitchell and Ruby arrive in Glendale, California. Oh, shit. So, how many days is this? So... This was on the 4th. Yes. So pretty much as soon as he got home, they packed up and took and off. And left. Yeah. They they took a bus. He ended up later tell, um, saying that they t- ended up taking a bus out of Charleston. 
Hmm. So they found their next target immediately, which was another Domino's in Glendale. Oh my gosh. The next day, they basically cased the place all day. And later on, they ended up going to a drugstore, bought a package of socks, underwear, a clothesline, and a knife. So around 11 p.m., that Domino's got a call from a man with a southern accent that asked for a pizza to be delivered to room 205 of the Regal Lodge Motel. I know exactly where both of these places are. Hmm. Um, and they're less than five minutes away from each other. They're very close to one another. I actually worked really close to both this motel and this Domino's, actually. Hmm. Drove past them quite a bit. Wow. So, a del- and it's crazy because when I when I started reading about this, I was like, oh, shit, I think I know where that Domino's is. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, shit, I know exactly where that Domino's <laughs> is. So, a delivery driver, 21-year-old John Harrigan, left Domino's around 11.25-ish in his Toyota truck to make the, the delivery. So, there were three men working this late, one being the delivery driver... 21 year old john harrigan Mm -hmm. um, another delivery driver 41 year old ed sycam and 19 year old assistant manager Corey spiroff um ed stayed behind to help Corey close up for the night um and Corey had already pulled the cash from the drawers and was making the end of the night deposit when he heard the front door to the store open so he walks to the front of the store thinking that it's john back from his delivery Uh uh-huh and this is around like 11 45 p.m but it wasn't John. There stood Mitchell and Ruby. So before Corey could even say, hey, we're closed, Mitch pulls his gun and very calmly says, go back in the office. Oh, gosh. So Ed was standing just off to the side. And when Mitch saw him, he ordered him to get in the office, too. So Corey tells them that their delivery driver would be back soon. And... Mitchell opened his jacket a little bit to reveal that he was wearing a Domino's uniform shirt with a name tag that said John. Oh, no. He chuckled and said, no, I don't think so. Oh, my God. That's like, that's literally something out of a movie. Yeah. Like, you don't think that that's, that actually happens in real life. Mm-hmm. And I'm sure that's what he was thinking, like. Ooh, this would be really cool if I did this. That would be terrifying for them. Oh, yeah. I couldn't... I can't even imagine what Corey and Ed felt. (sighs) But... So, they go behind the counter. Mitchell found a bank bag, and he handed the bag to Ruby to collect the money. Uh, Ruby had a butcher knife and was the one collecting the money from Corey. And Corey was interviewed in this, like, documentary that I saw. Um... Corey said that this would have been the perfect time to rob them because it was minutes from close and all the money from the day would be getting prepared to be deposited. <sighs> and again, as a former he, Domino's he employee, knows that. Mitchell would know this. So Mitchell tells Ruby to watch for fingerprints. So she wiped down the surfaces that she touched while Mitchell ordered Corey and Ed to stand in the corner of their office with the gun pointed right at them. Oh, my gosh. So, Corey, in the interview that I saw of him, said that he thought that Mitchell was going to kill them, like, at this point. But at that exact moment, they hear someone come in the store and yell out, hey, is anybody here? Holy crap. So, Corey says to Mitchell, like, what do you want me to do? And Mitchell says to him, don't do anything stupid or I'm going to blow this guy away. Again, something that you hear in an old shitty movie. Piss me off. So, Corey walks out to the front of the store and realized that it was one of their co-workers, a man by the name of Richard Wagner, who just wanted to order something for he and his wife and to say hello to his friends. Oh, no. So, Corey didn't want to get Richard involved, so he played it like he didn't know Richard. He didn't acknowledge him as a friend. He just looked down at what whatever they used to take orders. I don't know if it was like a pen pad or like maybe like a small computer or something at the time yeah and was just like what would you like to order and at first richard was really confused well, and seemed, yeah and he kind of was like trying to get Corey's attention like what are you doing kind of right. thing um but Corey just kept looking down kept asking like what would you like to order what would you like to order so richard played along 
Um, he was still very confused, of course, but just just placed his order. Yeah. And at this point, the phone rings while Corey is taking Richard's order. So Mitchell came out of the office with the fucking Domino's wearing the Domino's oh, uniform. Wow. With a cigarette in his hand, which is a big no no, by well, the way, obviously. for any for any food service, you shouldn't have I mean, a lit I, cigarette. I mean, I know it's the eighties. But, but still, I still think it's still a rule to not have a lit cigarette I, <laughs> behind the counter around the food. Right. I don't think that that was a thing. Right. Even then. So he has a cigarette in his hand and he answers the phone. Oh, I hate him. Saying like, thanks for calling, you know, Domino's Pizza. This is Mitch. How can I help you? Then what a proceeded dumbass. to take an order for delivery. I... I can't. Right? I don't even, I don't even know what to say for that. It's, it's nuts. So Richard finishes his order and Mitchell tells him to wait in his car and that they would bring the pizza to them. So Richard, obviously like alarm bells are ringing. He knew something was very off. Corey was acting very strange. And there's a strange man coming out of the back of the place where he worked, who he had never met before, who also had a cigarette right. behind the counter. And there he was like, what? Had a John name tag and said his name was Mitch? I don't even think he noticed the John name tag, though. I mean, maybe not, but still. Yeah, but still. He was but like, still. He was like, something very strange is going on. So Mitchell goes to the back, makes Richard's order. I can't. I- like, to I'm, the point where, like, all right, I'm, Ed, I'm, I'm fucking done. <laughs> no, 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 no. Sit down. <laughs> so he makes Richard's pizza. Then he takes it out to Richard. Like, here you go. Have a good night. Like, kind of thing. So Richard drove off and went to a payphone. He called his manager and then he called the cops because he's like, this place is being robbed. Well, good for him. Yeah. So if it, like, literally, if it wasn't for Richard Wagner, like... Let's just say Corey and Ed might have been dead if it weren't for Richard's quick thinking oh to call gosh. the police. So back in the store, Mitch led them into the walk-in cooler. So a walk-in cooler, anyone that hasn't worked food service before, a walk-in cooler is typically between 35 and 40 degrees. So there was a three-tier... Good sleeping weather. Yikes. <laughs> there was a three-tier rack against the wall of the walk-in. Mitchell pulled out the rope that he had gotten earlier that day and he tied Corey's hands behind his back, then took the rope and put it over the top shelf of the rack and pulled it down so that Corey's arms were like really high to where like he had to stand on his tiptoes. Oh, that would be awful. Then he tied the other end of the rope around Corey's neck. Then he did the same with Ed. So basically he kind of like made a homemade little torture device yeah and kind of like garroted them onto oh this my shelf gosh. he basically made it to where if they were to get like get off their tiptoes they would strangle to death they would literally hang themselves if they got off their tiptoes that is that is like an old timey torture yeah like medieval torture type of deal that's exactly what that is that's exactly what that is so, Corey, in his interview, said that when, because um, he tied Corey up first, and then when Mitch brought Ed back and was tying his up, Ed kind of, like, complained and said something about, like, how it was, like, painful. And Mitchell's response was, at least you're alive. Oh. Yeah. So, Mitch asked Corey when the walk-in would be open in the morning. Corey said 11 a.m. And Mitch said that he and Ruby would be in San Francisco by then. <laughs> Why are you telling him where you're going, you idiot? I think there was a reason for that. Oh, okay. But um, still. Corey asked about where John was because he's like, where's John? What did you do to John? And Mitch told him that he got held up at the motel and in his words said, they'll find him after they find you. Oh, so they yeah, shut the gosh. door to the walk-in and left a little after midnight. Just left them in there. Oh my god. In the meantime, I think they did... Um, I think Corey and Ed did manage to, like, knock over a box to stand on to try and, like, relieve a little bit of the pressure of being yeah. on their tiptoes. But they were still in there for a little while, and it was still very much 
struggling to stay alive to stay on their tiptoes well, yeah because you gotta think it's under 40 degrees it's not the freezer but it is cold in there right and then if you're in there for an extended period of time with no protection on your skin your fingers start to not work mm-hmm. and so do your feet right and they are standing on their tiptoes trying to stay alive so I can only I can only imagine how like scared they were. It'd be awful. So around twelve thirty AM the police finally pull onto the scene. So thank you, Richard. No kidding. So they make their way to the walk in and find Corey and Ed hanging from the shelves. Um, struggling to keep themselves from choking to death. The police immediately cut them down. And they were given blankets and jackets and basically anything to warm them up. Thank goodness they didn't have to actually stay there all night like that, though. No, I think they, uh, there were crime scene photos, of course, but I think that was, that's basically like, you know, immediately like, you know. Right. Um, They were questioned and Corey tells them about how John hasn't made it back Mm. and where he last delivered to. And I know I'm doing this part a little bit backwards, but there's a reason for that. So... The police arrive at the ho- at the motel. Um, they get the manager to let them into the room that Jodhan went on the delivery, which was registered under Mitchell's name. <laughs> Naturally. So the first thing they noticed was the sound of running water from the bathroom. Oh, no. And that's when they discovered John Harrigan's dead body in the bathtub. Oh, my gosh. The tub was full of water and John's body was submerged under the water on his right side. Hmm. Um, cold water was running at full blast onto the back of his neck and his head was just under the water. Um, the drain plug was broken, but the tub was filled with water up to the overflow valve. Mm -hmm. So it was running, but I don't think it was quite, um, overflowing just yet. Probably because the plug was right. Not working. So that's, that's why it was still running, but hadn't managed to overflow the tub or like flood the area or anything. So John was hogtied. Oh, wow. So his hands and feet were bound behind his back with a rope. That's what hogtied means, in case anybody just doesn't know what hogtied means. So same rope that was used to tie Corey and Ed to the walk-in racks. Same knots used as well. Huh. He was in the army. Oh, yeah. So his head was covered in a pillowcase which was secured with a rope ligature around his neck. There was a washcloth in his mouth and a sock tied around his head to hold the washcloth in his mouth. Unfucking real So investigators tore the room apart. There was no wallet, no money, or car keys belonging to John in the room. Oh, they took his car. The phone lines had been cut... The room had been cleaned, but they did manage to get a fingerprint off of the inside of a toilet paper roll that ended up being a match to Mitchell Sims. Whoa. Isn't that fucking... That... I would... I don't know that I would have thought about that. I fucking wouldn't. This is why I don't do that. (laughs) (laughs) And, like, honestly, this takes me right back to the Oba Chandler case. Yeah, and the Rogers the, women and how they pamphlet. were able, yeah, and how they were, well, no, they, the fact that they were able to identify these women whose bodies were just floating in Tampa Bay with that one fingerprint that they found on a toothpaste tube in their oh, hotel room. that's right. That took me right back to that case. That's um, crazy nuts. So they come to the conclusion that Mitchell and Ruby fled in John's truck, like you said. Yeah. So the pathologist that performed John Harrigan's autopsy, which I, I saw his name, but I didn't um, write it down, um, <laughs> said that um, the cause of death was the ligature strangulation. That in itself was enough to kill him, but he couldn't rule out the possibility that drowning contributed to John's death. Hmm. Um poor kid yeah the the ligature strangulation Stop. could have killed him within 10 minutes but there was evidence that drowning was also a possibility and i'm not going to go into the science i read it and of course like it didn't make a, lot, a ton of sense to me because i didn't 
I, I don't know exactly what everything means, but the ligature mark on John's neck was very deep. I saw a wow. picture of it. It was it was very deep. Well, I wonder if they did find a little water in his lungs then. Well, they... My phone's recording, so I can't look it up on that. No, I have it on here. <laughs> you have a computer in front of you. <laughs> All right, hold on one second. Okay, so basically what the pathologist said was that he couldn't rule out the possibility that drowning contributed to John's death based upon him being fully submerged in a bathtub of water with a gag in his mouth Mm -hmm. and the presence of frothy pulmonary edema in his trachea and bronchi. Oh, okay. Okay. A little bit of water in the lungs. Mm. God, that'd be awful. Yeah. It's sad. He was only 21. And of course, like Chris and Gary were only 24. Yeah. So Glendale police end up calling Domino's corporate office and find out about the murders in Hanahan, South Carolina as well. And think that this might be connected. So the two Domino's franchises on both sides of the countries, they got together to compare the notes on their robberies and of course find similar similarities which i find that i found that really cool that oh, both of these franchises actually came together that's kind of cool on um, on the opposite sides of the country right so the police contacted ed and Corey within a couple days of the incident saying something similar has happened in south carolina and that they had potential suspects would you please come in take a look at some pictures to try and identify them right so, again, I didn't see an interview by Ed, but I saw Corey's interview, and he said that he went into the police station. They showed him about, like, eight different pictures on a page, and Corey immediately picks out Mitchell. Mm. So, now the police, they're not looking for robbers. They're looking for serial killers now. Right. And for, for Mitchell, it was never about the money. It was literally about getting back at Domino's and its employees. Right. That's what it was. So, the police issue a nationwide alert for John Harrigan's stolen truck and the couple. The FBI put Mitchell's picture on national news, and he was even getting ready to be put on the FBI's 10 most wanted list at the time. Holy crap. Yeah, so this is how serious it was getting. Like, this was getting bigger and expanding and getting a lot of media attention. And to assist in the search, Domino's Pizza Corporation offered up a $100,000 reward for any information leading to their capture. Holy shit. And that's his 85? This is 85. Oh my yeah, gosh. Yeah, because, well, Domino's is like, some, like, first of all, those people are still out there. This has happened twice. It can happen again. Oh, yeah. We need to protect our employees. So I, I'm going to have to say kudos for Domino's because I've worked for some, like, food places that, literally don't give two shits Mm -hmm. and i have to say like good on dominoes for doing this like this is wow this is actually really great so december 21st 11 days after the murder of john harrigan police find an abandoned truck in a casino parking lot in las vegas remember when mitch was like oh we'll be in san Francisco." francisco right i think that was literally just to throw them off yeah. Because that's the only time that I, I heard that. Because, um, again, I read the appeal documents. And um, I think it was literally just to, like... Just to fuck with them. Yeah, exactly. So they run the plates and find that it's John Harrigan's missing truck. The truck had been wiped down, like everything else had been, and they found John's Domino's uniform and name tag inside. Wow. So every bit of media attention shifted towards the Las Vegas area, saying that the quote-unquote pizza killers were somewhere in Las Vegas. Just before midnight on Christmas Eve, police get an anonymous tip that Mitch and Ruby are hiding out in a motel nearby. Oh, man. The police find the hotel and immediately go to it. So just an aside, so this anonymous tip was from a man who had been at a local bar in Vegas, Mm -hmm. like around that time, and ended up having drinks with Mitch and Ruby at this bar. Holy shit, man. So that man ended up getting that reward from Domino's. Oh my god! So I don't know his name or anything. I just read a little something on like a news outlet that just kind of like put this up as like a little article. Yeah. Um, so someone interviewed him. Good job, dude. Yeah, so someone interviewed him, and they asked him, like, 
what are you going to do with the money? And he said the first thing he was going to do was buy his friends a drink. Because <laughs> he was at a bar, and I thought that was the funniest thing. That's just an aside. <laughs> Good job, dude. Good yeah. job. That is Kudos to you. Well, and that is the the case of um, you, you saw them. And you fucking reported it instead of just being like, oh, so I'm sure somebody else will do it. That's you, you didn't do the bystander effect. Yeah. Thank goodness. Yeah. Because that unfortunately happens with so many cases. Right. So police get to the motel around 2 a.m. Christmas Day. Like this is officially December 25th Christmas. Wow. And they surround it. So they have all the guns pointing at the door where right. they are so they knock on the door they don't really know what to expect because they're like because of his crimes they're like he might want to like go out in a blaze of glory right. we don't really know what to expect but mitch just opens the door and puts his hands up and ruby was sitting on the bed behind him neither of them said anything and the arrest went so smoothly that the police chief at the time said that it was probably one of the easiest arrests he's ever made and it really surprised him. Oh, wow. So that that makes me uneasy. So I think they realized how outnumbered they were and how the police had far superior firepower. Well, obviously. And it was like all pointed at them. And not not to mention like they had been on this high yeah of uh, like we're robbing things we're killing people. Mm-hmm. This took place within three weeks. Yeah. So this all happened very quickly. They're on this high and now they they officially have had to come down from it. Right. So at this point, they just give up, which is probably for the best. So the police got them out of the room and they started to search the room. They found the fully loaded, it was fully loaded, 25 caliber handgun under the mattress And the cash bag from the Glendale robbery. On the table by the bed, they found a yellow page torn from a Vegas phone book where Mitch and Ruby circled local Vegas pizza places. Good So they were literally in the process of planning their next hit. Oh my gosh. So Christmas Day, Corey and Ed are notified that Mitch and Ruby had been caught and are in custody. And I literally put in my notes, what a fucking Christmas gift. No shit. So once in custody, Mitch at first wasn't talking. Um, Very tight lip. But eventually he talked a little bit, but it wasn't, it wasn't like he was giving the investigators like everything they wanted. Like they have a recording of him being like, I had to kill that boy. He saw my face. And then there was another time where he was like, again, they had recorded him and he said something along the lines of like, well, I was drunk. I didn't know what I was and whatever. Don't, don't even. Yeah, whatever. Don't even. Yeah. So Ruby, however, had no issue throwing Mitch under the bus. <laughs> True love. Yeah. Um, she said it was all Mitch's idea and she went into great detail about the events of the day and at the motel. So according to Ruby... They spent the day casing the store in Glendale, then later went to a drugstore for a knife and a rope. Apparently, when they had first gotten to Glendale, they actually stopped at the Domino's to ask for directions while Corey was working. And Corey had, like, remembered them. Oh, my gosh. From earlier. So that night, they ordered a pizza to be delivered to their room and said that it was, again, according to Ruby said that it was a trap to lure a Domino's delivery driver there. So as soon as John Harrigan entered the room, Mitch attacked him. He kneed him in the stomach and took his money at gunpoint. Oh my gosh. John didn't resist at all. He was compliant with everything Mitch said. And she said that Mitch didn't want to shoot John because of the noise, so he decided to tie him up instead. So... The original plan was supposedly to leave him at the motel, but I think it was just Mitchell's, like, leave no witness plans that made him, you know. No, I think he just wanted to kill him. I I think think he just wanted to figure out another way to kill somebody because he could have easily killed both Corey and Ed, but he didn't. I'll get there. So 
that's when Mitch shoved a rag in John's mouth and then tied a sock around his head, you know, put the pillowcase over his head so that John could barely breathe. Um, Ruby said that Mitchell by himself dragged John and dumped him into the tub and then held his head under the water until he was sure he was dead. Then they went to the store and robbed it. Ruby didn't take any responsibility for the murder. She claimed she was just along for the ride and blamed everything on Mitch. But according to Ed and Corey, she was an active and willing participant in the robbery. Well, yeah. Corey in the interview said that it even seemed like he said that it it seemed like they like fed off one another, like the kind of people who like bring out the worst qualities in each other. Right. Again, that's what I I was trying to say, like with they were on this high Mm -hmm. and it's kind of, I don't know. I feel like it's almost like mob mentality, like something that you wouldn't normally do by yourself. Right. You do with someone else. Right. Um, but I think Mitchell would have, I think Mitchell would have done this regard. You know what? We'll get to it. Um, so the two were charged in both states. And even though it started in South Carolina, in South Carolina wanted them to come back immediately to be charged. Oh, yeah, I would imagine. But California had a better case against Ruby. So because she wasn't involved in the murders in South Carolina, to anyone's knowledge anyway... Right. She only stepped into radar when she went to Glendale. Right. So in California, they were charged with three counts of armed robbery, two counts of attempted murder, and one count of first degree murder with uh, special circumstances. So special circumstances. I'll I'll explain. Oh, okay. So Ruby faced life while Mitchell faced the death penalty. In California. Yes. This was eighty five. Oh, okay. And I'll get to that too. <laughs> Okay. So they decide, lawyers decide separate trials. So Ruby starts first in January of 1987. Mm -hmm. She pled not guilty. And without going into like a ton of detail about each of their trials, because there's like things in each of them. Basically, the big issue within Ruby's trial was whether or not Ruby helped Mitch put John in the tub. So Yeah, well, I was going to say, it seems like that'd be a lot of trouble for one person to do. Well, basically, it was a lot of back and forth. Right. Because it was like, okay, so if she was, if she did help him put him into the tub, then that puts her hands on to be charged with, with murder. The murder. If not, then we have to rethink, ba ba ba. And they were both being tried with the three counts armed robbery, two counts attempted, one count first degree special circumstances. They were both being charged that in California. Okay. So a ton of back and forth. They decide that Ruby had to have been involved because it would have been too difficult for Mitch to drag and lift John, who was hogtied, into the bath by himself. Right. Because even though he's only 21, I mean, that's a full-grown man at this point. Yeah. And even with you being a man at this point as well, that's still going to be really hard for one person to do, to drag a full, basically kind of dead weight body. True. And I I will say, like, adrenaline can do some crazy shit to your body. Sure, absolutely. But I don't think that it was at that point where the adrenaline was giving Mitch superhuman strength. I don't (laughs) think that. Right, right. I mean, even if it was Mitch yelling, hey, help me, Carrie, she still had to have been a participant in that. So the jury took six days to deliberate and found wow. her guilty of first degree murder with special with special circumstances and the robbery, but was acquitted on the two counts of attempted murder. I don't fucking know why. People said that the jury may have felt like sympathy for her. I don't know who the jury consisted of. So she was found guilty on murder with cer- special she, cir- circumstances. She was found guilty on the first degree murder with special circumstances and the um, three counts of armed robbery. But she was acquitted of the two counts of attempted murder. Now, was that for Corey and Ed? Yeah. Oh, okay. okay Which okay, okay. I find that preposterous. Well, because I if, can if they're see no, if it, it dish. No, no. <laughs> You know why? Because she was there. She admitted that she was there for this. I get that. But the first degree murder is the is the part where they're really debating. Mm-hmm. I and think the three counts of armed robbery and the two attempted murder. Um, she was very present for all of that. 
So I find it preposterous that she was acquitted of those, but I digress. Um, yeah, I can. Mm, yeah, I, so, I, can, I can see both sides, really. Whatever. <laughs> so she is sentenced under California law to a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Good. So March 10th, 1987, Mitch's trial begins. Uh, the prosecution described him as an angry, violent man yeah. who was out seeking revenge. But once he started killing, he got a taste for it. Mm -hmm. In Mitch's mind, he is the victim. He's been wronged. And the only way for him to regain his power is to take it from other people and make them the victims. That's, That's pretty spot very on. Very spot on. Thank you, yeah. prosecutors. You did a good job. Good job. So Mitch's attorneys didn't attempt to prove his innocence. They can't. They're just focused right. on getting him out of the death penalty at right. this point. Right. Like, if they can get life in prison, that's a win. Right. So, the special circumstance was whether or not there was a plan to lure and kill the Domino's delivery driver. So, whether or not there was a plan to kill John Harrigan. Uh, yeah. I so, think there was. So Mitch's attorney said that John's death was an accident. You don't accidentally no. hogtie no, 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 somebody. No. no. I'd be like, so, wh whoops, no, there's no, no, some no, no, rope no. here. How did you get like that? So he claimed that Mitch tied him up and put him in the tub, but the drowning was an accident. Oh, bullshit. Okay. Oh, so, bullshit. Yeah, but here's the thing. It's a shitty defense, but what the fuck else are his lawyers going to say? What other defense can they in, can they come to? They're See, like, no, this no, no, is why yes, I couldn't be an attorney. Yes, he, he, yeah. I mean, he hog tied him. He like choked him a little bit. Yeah, he threw him in a bathtub. But I mean, he just died in the bathtub. Mitch had nothing to do with that. But again, what else are his lawyers gonna say in his defense? Bullshit. This again, why I could not be an, an attorney and try to defend exactly. these. But the jury was Monsters. like, yeah, but the jury was like, yeah, fucking right. <laughs> so March 20th. It's all right through that. Exactly. Like I said, what, what else are they even going to do? <sighs> so Mitchell is found guilty on all charges. Um, Good. But once they go to sentencing, his lawyers try one more Hail Mary and well, say yeah. that Mitchell Sims shouldn't be held completely responsible for his crimes because of his tumultuous childhood. Again, the jury was like, nah, death sentence. <laughs> so, yeah, I, no. I get that he had a horrible childhood. I get that. But he had but siblings you make, that didn't become murderers. You make your own fucking choices exactly. in life. Now, I, don't get me wrong. I feel, I feel like his constant um, feeling of always being the victim in every situation... The, that definitely stems from that definitely the stems from a childhood. His his constant thinking that he is always the victim. He's the one that's always being wronged. And in order to regain power, you have to take somebody else's. That is from his childhood, right? But that is definitely from his childhood. However, you are in charge of your own actions. Yes. Regardless Absolutely. of your shitty childhood. Well, and there are people that have super shitty childhoods uh -huh. that ultimately may struggle with addiction in their teenage or adult years who don't kill people. Exactly. So that's why the jury was like, no. Death sentence. <laughs> so. Oh, people. Oh. So people he got, pissed me off. Yeah. So he was sentenced to to death in the state of California and at this time in California that meant the gas chamber oh shit so then Mitchell and Ruby are sent to Cal sent to South Carolina for the murders of Chris Zare and Gary Mulkey right Mitchell received a second death sentence after six hours of deliberation oh damn yes and they they said that he was like very cold and very callous during this because I mean He's already gotten one death sentence. How much deader could you get? Right. And Ruby, during her trial, is found um, accessory after the fact in South Carolina. I mean, she did essentially help him escape. Exactly. The big cir special circumstance was whether or not there was a plan to kill the delivery driver. I think there was. Obviously there was. 
obviously there was. He came right. very prepared to do so. Well, yeah. They were, I mean, they were making plans all day. Yeah. I mean, they that's, were they were calculated enough to clean all the things that they possibly think they could. I mean, a clean hotel room. The they wiped all their shit off uh, in the restaurant. I mean, yeah, yeah. There yeah, was a there was fucking a plan. plan. There was a plan. There obviously was. So since then, that was 1987 when both of them were sentenced in California. Right. So both. Um, are serving their time in California state prisons. Mm-hmm. Ruby is currently at the California Institution for Women in Corona, and Mitch is on death row in San Quentin. Still currently? Currently. Oh, shit. Um, both of them have exhausted their appeals. Mm-hmm. Now, with Ruby, there now there is a change.org petition that is trying to get her life with the possibility of parole, they just want her to be able to get to the parole board to make her case. Mm. And however you feel about that, there are some people that are on Ruby's side because supposedly they didn't let her childhood come out during the trial. But I personally don't think that that would have made a difference. I don't think that's relevant. Well, because I think they already had a little bit of sympathy for her because I guess when... Um, she was evaluated. She did have, I think it was, um, like battered woman's syndrome. Is that what it's called? I don't, um, I don't know. I'm just, I'm literally just spouting this off the top of my head. I'm not even reading from notes anymore. This is just everything that I've seen thus far. So uh, the big thing about, about her people trying to get her life with the possibility of parole is basically just saying like, she wasn't able to to state all of her case but i personally don't think that really matters because like with mitchell she basically they're like mitchell was made her her do this her then abuser and she was gonna go along with whatever he said and i'm like well i mean if that's the case then she's still dangerous in my eyes because if she allows herself to go along with whatever mitchell said like do you think that that's not going to happen if she gets in another relationship? Like, unless she actually gets help. Mm. So, I don't really know how I feel about Ruby maybe someday getting parole, but currently she's 55 years old. Oh. Um, but, but like Corey said, though, Corey clearly saw he's like, she definitely... Yeah. Well, here, here's the thing. I think... Was a willing participant. Exactly. And the fact that they fed from one another. I, I think that basically Ruby, um, I think it was exciting. Again, they were on this high. They were Robin. They mm-hmm. were being like Bonnie and Clyde, whatever. Right. You know? So, I don't know. I think it pretty much stands true. Like, I don't, I don't have an issue with Ruby being, not having parole. I don't, I don't really care that much. Like, I think she's exactly where she should be. So yeah. moving on to Mitchell, because that's basically all that I have of Ruby, because there's, as as of right now, I mean, cases like these, like, there's not really, like, a ton that I could find on the internet, and unless it's something that is, like, really happening and getting immediate, getting media attention, mm-hmm. nobody's going to report on it. Right. I mean, nobody's right. going to, like, be like, Ruby starts her day by da 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 they're not gonna do that right like this is some small case that happened within three weeks in 1985 right nobody's gonna be reporting on her so mitchell however again they've both exhausted their appeals right so on death row once you've exhausted your appeals you usually you know you're waiting for for the day just waiting for getting a date set basically exactly So, Gary Melke's family has already said that once a date is set for him, that they will fly to California and watch his execution. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, is this, it's not gas chamber though, right? No. No. Okay. (laughs) But. Because I was going to say, wait a second, you mentioned that. Yeah. At the time, (laughs) being sentenced to death in 85 in California meant that you would get the gas chamber. However... With California death penalty, of course, it has gone back and forth, back and forth. Right. Being a thing, not being a thing, all that good stuff. 
So Mitch was sentenced in 87 in California. Again, which at the at the time meant the gas chamber. So, of course, since then, it's been repealed. It's been put back. All that good stuff. Currently, there are over... And like I said, he's out of appeals now. Mm-hmm. There are over 700 people on California's death row. Currently. Wow. As we speak. Now... There have been attempts to get, basically, there's two people that are next in line to be executed in California, mm-hmm. one of them being Mitchell Sims. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, because um, he, he's been on death row since For 87. 87. Yeah. So, it's him and there's this one other guy. There have been, of course, like governors that have came and went One of the last governors, um, Governor Jerry Brown, there was like several previous Democratic governors of other states that were basically trying to get him before he left office in 2019. Yes. In 2019, there were basically like a, a bunch of previous governors that were trying to get him to like do like a blanket clemency over these like 700 inmates. And that I, I read you an article mm-hmm. about how people were like, that is preposterous. Every single, which I think that is too. And I, I hate the fact that governors have that kind of power, uh, but I'm not going to get into that because that's just how I feel. But I think every, which is why the death penalty is such a, a weird sensitive topic because i think it definitely depends on the case yeah every case is different yeah and every one has its own particular level of horror right and i don't yeah. think that just one big old blanket pardon is is good for anybody well i get that and i think it's that's a, a big old f you to the families of the victims of these violent offenders right on death row and i and i get the argument that there could be innocent people on death row i get that and there probably is which is awful but not all of them are actually innocent like this guy yeah because i like i understand but if it's if it's the kind of case with like this where it's like there's an overwhelming amount of evidence against this person. This person very clearly committed these crimes. Mm -hmm. So it's, I don't know. I'm not going to get into it, but there have been, there have been a lot of people petitioning to get Mitchell Sims date all through the 2010s. People have been trying to get him. Oh, an execution date. Yeah. To get California execution date. Um, not like a romantic date. No, 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 no. Um, but he's still currently sitting on death row and the current governor, cause I don't believe, I think Jerry Brown may have granted like clemency for maybe like a few people. Cause you mm-hmm. know, like every governor right. and like president does that shit when they leave office. He did not do like the blanket pardon of having like all those, however many 700 something, something people get um like life sentences without the possibility of parole they do still have death sentences and currently gavin newsom which is the current california governor Mm -hmm. has no plans to execute anybody while he's in office Mm. so whether you agree with the death penalty or not i think that this in particular justice hasn't been served yet a jury, I mean, a jury of his peers convicted him of these crimes and sentenced him to death. Yes, he's in prison. He's no longer... He's not getting out. He's not. But it still, it does aggravate me. As an aside, one of Mitchell's children, who I know, who I know his name is Michael, actually... I forgot he had kids. Yep. Um, they Did he ever actually get divorced from his wife? I think so. Or at, before, at least I mean, before now, this stuff happened. That I'm actually not 100% sure. I never found for a fact that he got a divorce. I'm sure he did. I'm sure. Because he was paying alimony, or not alimony, but he was paying child, child support, support to her. But his son did write a book. They got to basically get to know their father while he was in jail in South Carolina, you know, wow. awaiting trial. 
And one of his sons did write a book basically about being a son of a man on death row. Um, wow. He's like kind of a godly man. I guess Mitchell accepted God while in prison, mm-hmm. you know, all that, all that stuff. Yeah. So, so basically when I, when I said before about Ruby, maybe like wanting to be a big movie star. Mm-hmm. So the reason that I did bring that up is because of all the places that they fled to once Mitchell killed Chris and Gary in South Carolina, of all the places that they fled to, they went to Glendale, California. Well, cause which if is his in thing Los was, Angeles County. Right. If his thing was he's pissed at Domino's and he's a disgruntled employee and he just wants a big old fuck you to all Domino's, how many Domino's did you pass Yeah, from North Carolina? North South, South Carolina. South Carolina to frickin' California. Yeah. How many did you pass? Yeah, so I, I honestly, I don't know what the reason was to go to Glendale, California, of all places. Right. I don't know. But obviously, they had made a plan because yeah. I, I think, because they took a bus from Charleston, South Carolina, to Glendale. And mm-hmm. I'm sure they did, like, other buses and shit. But they, they basically took a bus to Glendale and I truly believe that they had the plan to kill the delivery driver Absolutely. and take the vehicle. Mm-hmm. And that's what they were going to use because to continue their heist. the whole thing was Mitch didn't have a vehicle because his truck broke down. Because of they, dominoes. They had to take a bus to California so they didn't have a ride while they were there. They exactly. needed something. Exactly. Ugh. So that is the case of Mitchell Carlton Sims and Ruby Carolyn Paget. That is nuts. It's wild. It is very wild. Yeah. Making a fucking pizza. And and seriously, dude, you answer the phone. This is Mitch. I know. I thought out of all this, that was one of the dumbest decisions. Seriously. I'm like, really? You say your own fucking name? In the middle of a robbery? Yeah. You dumb piece of shit. Whatever. <laughs> like, in, in the whole, had, you know, John had to die because he saw him. Again, three other people saw you in the other dominoes. So that's a piss poor reason. Yeah. I, I Here's the thing. I think that he probably thought that... Um, and again, I, I truly think that he did start enjoying the killing. Yeah, absolutely. Like he shot Chris and Gary. He felt that sense of power and he wanted to continue getting that sensation. Yeah. So I think that he really thought that, um, Corey and Ed would end up dying in the lock in the cooler. I think that he thought that they would probably end up dying. And I think this is just my opinion, personally. Like, I have no grounds of why I think this, but just from what I've read about Mitchell Sims and researching him and his crimes, I think that he probably thought that, like, the idea of them suffering in the walk-in probably gave him a sense of pleasure and power as well. Yeah. And, like, sure, they may not die right away by my hand, but I know that they're suffering and in pain, and that makes me happy. Right. You know, I think that's, I think that's just what it is. It was just a big individual. Yeah. It was just a big old middle finger to dominoes. And yeah, I mean, I'm sure the, some of his actions were definitely affected by his childhood, but at the end of the day, you are in charge of your actions and your decisions. Yep. No matter how shitty your childhood was. And Mm -hmm. he's exactly where he needs to be. Yeah. So. Yeah. But yeah. That's the, that is my case that I brought this week. It is very wild. And it, and it's so crazy that it takes place, all of this happens within three weeks. Yeah. Oh, it's I wild. remember what I was going to say yeah. um, about if they didn't find each other. Do you think uh, one or the other? Here's the thing. I think that Mitchell, regardless if he had met Ruby or not, I think there was already a lot of hostility and a lot of um, just disgust for the world already brewing. And I think that regardless had he had met Ruby, I think he would have eventually did some sort of violent crime. 
Maybe right. not murder, but robbery, probably. It wouldn't, it wouldn't shock me. Well, considering basically the first two murders was without Ruby. Exactly. And again, we don't really know the role that she actually played within those murders. Right. Was she a part of the planning and maybe just wasn't there? I don't know. Or maybe she was there. There were no witnesses to that crime. Right. You know? So as far as we know, she wasn't involved. But that's that's all that we know. I, Ruby, I, I kind of go back and forth with Ruby. I think that if it wasn't with Mitchell, it might have been with somebody else. Yeah, and maybe maybe this was just um, when she found Mitch, this was, I don't know, how they made things exciting, basically. She may not have, like, done this with somebody else. Maybe not. And again, if like... she had found somebody else that was more, she seems, like, more complacent. To me, like, she was going along with what he did. I mean, regardless, she still did it. So she still needs to be held accountable. But maybe, may not have? I don't know. I mean, I don't... Like I said, I'm, I'm really maybe not, not sure. Have, like you were saying about Mitch, maybe not had killed anybody or got to that point if she hadn't found an angry person like Mitch. But I... Possibly if she, I mean, she wasn't, well, you said she wasn't working and she was expecting Mitch to provide. So maybe if she could have done some like, pe- you know, theft or something well, like that's, that. Well, that's what I was thinking. I was like, I could, I could probably think that she would probably do some like petty crimes. Right. Maybe not, maybe not violent, maybe violent. I don't know. But I think along, I, I think Ruby went along with the men in her life because of because of her childhood you know it's what she saw at home this is what she saw at home this is what she assumed that life was like and basically she just went along with what they did and i think she got some enjoyment from it Mm -hmm. depending on on what that enjoyment was but i think regardless i think the two of them would have eventually committed crimes even if they hadn't met, I'm yeah. sure Mitchell probably would have committed some violent crimes regardless of having met Ruby. Yeah, I feel like he definitely would have. I think, I think, I, I think Mitchell's issues had been brewing for a very long time. Right, the Domino's things just set it off, basically. It, exactly, and it was, he was abusing substances. I think he was having a lot of issues that maybe could have been worked out. Like, had he gotten help? Had he maybe right. been put on some medication, maybe had some therapy. I don't know. I definitely think that he should have gotten therapy regardless. Right. But definitely. I, well, because he needed that because nobody should have to go through that childhood no, that he went through. I feel bad for the child. Right. But as an adult, like, I don't feel bad for you. No, not at this point because you chose that. Exactly. So, yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of. And, and don't try to pull that I was crazy out of my head because of drugs or alcohol. No, 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 no. No, no. <laughs> try, try something else because that doesn't work. Yeah. So, yeah, that is uh, the case this week. Crazy. Yeah. So thank you all for joining us this week. I'm sorry it's it was a little bit of a long one, but I didn't feel like it was long enough to put into two different episodes. So I was like, you know what, fuck it. Strap in, grab your popcorn, go pee, <laughs> and listen. So, but yes, thank you all for joining us this week. And if you'd like to stay updated with us... Um, you can follow us on Facebook at 2K Away. You can follow us on Instagram at 2K Away Podcast. We have a YouTube channel, 2K Away Podcast. And you can also contact us. We have a Gmail where you can contact us, where you can request something or just say hello. That is 2K Away Podcast <laughs> at gmail.com. <laughs> and we had a little, I had, well, I had a little bit of goal and I shared it with Paige and then it became our goal. So we're in almost all the continents of Which uh, like, love. getting listeners and That's my goal so was cool. my goal was to make it into africa because we still hadn't had any any listeners there and 
now we are. So it's Algeria and Nigeria, I believe, that we've now entered into. And it's it's so it's so great. Like I absolutely love it. And I just thank you everybody that continues to listen to us. (laughs) Seriously. To to listen to us to dumbasses who are morbid and weird talk an hour every week <laughs> right about murder and just mayhem right and i i will say like we want to do like better with research and we just want to keep doing this and um i think our researching skills have gotten better over time yeah. mine certainly have <laughs> <laughs> yeah this one did you can definitely tell this one you did better yes I, I think with every episode you can tell if I really get into it or not right <laughs> so and I'm definitely like I'm making like a promise to myself and to our faithful listeners I'm trying to do better <laughs> I am doing better so because I want people to continue listening to us I want to I want this to be like a space where you can go and you can get your little dose of spooky and right. your true crime and anybody who's interested in true crime I know like that's not for everybody and the people that are interested in true crime sometimes get judged for being into it right and like in like like listening to like the gross details this You're is not gonna get judged here this is a place for you <laughs> <laughs> so. And we just want to continue doing yeah. that, basically. So, yeah. All right. So, thank you, everybody, for listening this week thank to you. the case of Mitchell Sims and Ruby Paget. So, we'll see you all in... We'll see you all. We'll see you all I don't know who next that, week. I don't know who that was. I'm not sure where you were trying to go with that. I don't know, man. All right. We'll see you all next week. Bye. Bye. Bye.